Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Gus Lehrer, about to start the third and final lecture in my series of three about invariant theory. Um, <clears throat> I will be circulating. Last time, um, I came to a um, diagrammatic formulation of the second fundamental theorem, the uh, classical groups. Still in the classical context, but a non-classical way of, um, uh, of deriving one of the classical uh, results. Um, today we're going to move on, and uh, I just want to begin by uh, recapping the, um, <clears throat> uh, the main lemma and the ideas that go into its proof. Therefore, share my screen. Right, so I want to start at this point, uh, make some remarks about the proof of the main lemma. Um, first of all, let's recall the statement. Um, we define an involution on the set of all endomorphisms of vector space V um, <clears throat> by that equation. We have this map omega, which takes us from the um, uh, endomorphisms to the dagger symmetric endomorphisms. It's a quadratic map. And the statement is that um, uh, if you have a function which is invariant under the isometry group, so you have this, e this just means simply that f of g a equals f of a for all g in the isometry group g. Then you have an extension of this function to the um, uh, 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 <coughs> dagger symmetric matrices. So the first uh, step, and here I'm going to use colloquial language such as Atia did, and I um, urge you to. Um, and go to the uh, paper which um, uh, Ruben Zhang and I wrote about the second fundamental theorem in the um, Nagoya journal, where we point out where there is a small gap uh, in Atiyah's argument. So I'm not going to point out that gap um, in these lectures. So we take indeterminates xij corresponding to the matrix entries. And we take that uh, uh, R to be the, uh, the uh, polynomial ring and K to be its field of fractions. And L to be a further extension of K, which splits that polynomial. And secondly, you extend everything to this larger field. You impose linear relations on the Xij, which are implied by the equation that A is symmetric. And of course, those constraints uh, depend um, on which case you happen to be in. So the argument I'm giving now is very generic, and it applies even for the orthosymplectic case, um, <clears throat> although there are there's some remarks one needs to make about algebraic geometry over superalgebras. And I haven't introduced superalgebras yet, although I will very shortly. The fourth step is that every uh, generic matrix, um, now generic implies non-singular, and we've already seen that the non-singular uh, matrices, which are symmetric, are in, in some the, the space of those is the same as the uh, quotient space of uh, GLV or GL, whatever the extension field is, by the fixer of one, which is the group that we're speaking about, the isometry group. And we want to show that uh, the, a generic such matrix um, has a, uh, an uh, omega root. So it, every generic matrix can be realized as omega X. And that is actually... Um, uh, a non-trivial calculation. Um, one has to do something uh, here. Um, in, in the language of algebraic geometry, uh, one proves that omega is a faithfully flat morphism. And, um, in, um, and, uh, and uh, finally, um, if one is given an invariant function, 
And this uh, function has a unique extension to the um, uh, one given by the field extension. And then one proves Galois theoretically that um, uh, this uh, uh, function actually takes values in K. And so one deduces that the value of this is a rational function of the entries of omega x. Hence, there's a rational function defined on a Zariski dense subset of E plus such that F is equal to F composed with omega. Um, <clears throat> that is actually not a huge advance in its own right because we want a regular function. Um, <clears throat> And finally, um, by the irreducibility of uh, E plus um, and the fact that F is a regular function, uh, and I'm sorry, F is a regular function uh, is what we're trying to prove. And, and, this, and the fact that this relation holds on all of E, F um, must be um, uh, regular. So that was uh, the... Uh, projected end of my uh, second lecture, uh, which uh, went a little bit too slowly. So I am going to need to get a, a hurry up. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I want to now um, uh, introduce um, uh, Lee super algebras. Well, we start off with Z2 graded. Super just means Z2 graded means there are two graded components, a zero component and a one component. And um, <clears throat> uh, there is some complication with signs. Um, we take a V to be a Z2 graded C vector space and its super dimension is just the pair um, MN like this. And we suppose that it has an even non-degenerate um, bilinear form, which is symmetric on V naught, on the even part, skew symmetric on the uh, odd part, and uh, in which the, um, <coughs> the um, odd and even parts are orthogonal to, um, to each other. So the um, uh, super dimension of V um, has to be um, M, the even part can be anything, but the odd part has to be a symplectic space. So that's called an orthosymplectic superspace. If V and W are uh, Z2 graded, so are the dual space of V, the tensor W, and the home space in a way which is entirely transparent. And uh, there, there are no surprises in, in the definition. Um, you simply add, uh, if you take a tensor product um, or even a home space, you add the parity of the, uh, of the relevant uh, uh, constituents. And so in particular, so is the space of endomorphisms. If the super dimension is MN, then the general linear subalgebra, which is the first superalgebra, which we are going to meet, um, is called GLV or GLMN, and it is the graded, uh, the Z2 graded Lie algebra, uh, NC of V, with Lie product given by a, a small twist. Of the, of the usual um, Lie product. So um, X is the parity. And so you multiply the parities together. So in particular, if you have an even element and an odd element, uh, the parity, you get a zero here. So the orthosymplectic Lie algebra is a Z2 graded subalgebra of GLM2N which is defined by the following equation. It's very similar to the case of a Lie algebra in um, the uh, non-super world. 
you simply insist that um, uh, xvw plus a certain sign times uh, vxw um, is equal to zero. So you can see this incorporates both the orthogonal and uh, symplectic cases. If you're in, your, in the orthogonal case, everything is positive. So this sign doesn't arise. And so all you've got is xvw plus vxw is zero. Um, and uh, in the symplectic case, you, you, have the, um, you have the opposite. Always get a minus one there. <clears throat> uh, Lee superalgebras act on the space of tensors, just like in the non-super world, except that you have a sign, this sign. And the rule is basically, every time you interchange something, you add a sign. So, for example, if x moves past v1, you have to put uh, sine minus 1 to the x, the, the parity of x times the parity of v1. And that's how all of these arise. Um, you can check that this is a perfectly good action. And the subalgebra um, OSP M2X, M2N uh, acts correspondingly on the uh, tensor uh, power. Further, the group, which is the orthogonal group of the even part, um, direct product, the symplectic group on the odd part, um, also acts on this tensor power, compatibly with the orthosymplectic uh, Lie algebra, and they form a Harish Chandra pair. We'll see in a moment that one of the um, uh, challenges uh, in the um, uh, super world is that you generally don't have um, uh, concrete groups of matrices to work with. You uh, can formulate things in terms of Hopf algebras, group schemes, um, or you can invent devices like I'm going to do in uh, this lecture um, and take groups over the um, uh, uh, super algebra of um, uh, uh, the, the most general super algebra, if you, if you like, the exterior algebra on a countable set of generators. So we have the endomorphisms, which we've seen before. The tau, um, as you'd expect, is going to have a sign in it. This sign you can check is compatible with the uh, orth orthogonal and symplectic um, cases, which we've already uh, treated. Um, and E, find in a similar way to the classical orthogonal and symplectic cases using dual homogeneous basis, basis of V. Um, it's a little more complicated, but you'll remember E was this. Um, invariant uh, so-called um, Casimir um, uh, element. It's, it's, it looks like basically uh, the sum of bi tensor b upper i, where these are dual uh, uh, homogeneous uh, bases of v. As in the classical cases, you get a functor from uh, the Brouwer um, algebra, but this time with um, a parameter uh, m minus 2n, which is essentially the, um, uh, the dimension of a, of a superspace, to the uh, category of representations of uh, OSP. So, the Brouwer algebra uh, acts on the tensor power, the tensor to the R. And that action commutes with that of OSP and of G. Uh, G, you'll remember, is just this um, uh, half of the Harris Chandra pair. Now, the first and second fundamental theorems for. Um, uh, 
uh, OSP, um, are proved uh, in a not very um, uh, straightforward way, but with some difficulty, um, uh, in a in a, a quite a similar uh, way. Um, the first version uh, we gave was um, uh, in 2013, uh, didn't appear then, um, but this, we have a surjective map from this Brouwer algebra to, to the endomorphs. That's, that's the, um, the, the first fundamental theorem. And uh, one should also acknowledge that uh, Sergeyev um, uh, did a lot of work on this, and he had essentially um, this, this proof, although I must confess that I uh, don't understand um, his proof uh, of it. And uh, the second uh, statement is, uh, and although this was published only uh, last year, seven years later than, than this in the Nagoya Journal, the um, kernel of this map is described as follows. So there is a canonical isomorphism of vector spaces. Um, we've seen this before in the classical cases um, from the Brouwer algebra um, to, uh, from R to R, the morphisms from R to R, and the morphisms from 2R to naught. It's very, very simple. If you get a, a morphism from R to R, it's like that. And if you just pull all the strands up, you get a morphism from naught to 2R. And equally, if you pull all the strands down, then you get a, uh, an element of, of B2R. So this is an isomorphism. So the image of the um, kernel under this isomorphism is this uh, D naught times I M N, where I M N is the ideal of the um, uh, group ring of the symmetric group of degree two R generated by the Frobenius idempotent um, corresponding to a certain Young diagram, which just the one which corresponds to a rectangle that looks like that. So you have a Young diagram like that. Corresponding to this, there is a Frobenius um, idempotent. You take the row group and the column group and the, the, um, uh, the uh, symmetrizing idempotent for the row group, the anti-symmetrizing idempotent for the column group, and um, you simply multiply them together. Um, and uh, that is the ideal we're speaking about, the two-sided ideal. And so this uh, D and D naught, I, I remind you, is just this diagram. And so down here, you have this item, this item potent, I'll call this item potent E n plus one, uh, two n plus one, then you can have anything underneath there. To get an element of the, of the um, uh, kernel, uh, oh, this is unfortunately a, uh, uh, an obsolete uh, thing. The, this is, is not uh, an unsolved problem anymore. The exact constraint is actually that R is greater than M plus one times N plus one. And this is a result of my student, Yang Zhang. In the circulated version of these notes, uh, this will be correct. I want to point out that although I haven't got time to go into um, a specific example. Um, all the modules we're considering here are almost always not semi-simple. Um, so if you take, for example, just V tensor V, that is generally not a semi-simple um, uh, algebra. So it, it's not a semi-simple module. And therefore, um, the
uh, first and second fundamental theorems in this case are in some sense more significant than they are in the classical cases because they assert that um, two non-semi-simple algebras are isomorphic. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned briefly earlier that um, one approach to proving these things um, is one could um, work in the context of uh, Grassmann algebras, um, that is the universal uh, exterior algebra. So we let lambda p to be, uh, we let that be the um, exterior algebra on a finite dimensional complex vector space. And you just take the direct limit of all of those, then that is the Grassmann algebra. And if uh, it has a countable set of generators, uh, theta one, theta two, and so on, um, they satisfy the condition that they're anti-commute and a C basis for the set of, of um, a C basis uh, of the algebra is the set of those theta i whenever you take an ascending sequence of indices. Um, of course, if uh, n is even, you get an even element. And if n is odd, you get an odd element. So this is itself a z2 graded algebra. In some sense, it is the universal z2 graded algebra. And so in studying uh, problems associated with super algebras, um, one uh, technique available to us is to simply extend scalars to lambda. And then uh, this becomes a z2 graded lambda module. Um, there are attendant difficulties. You have to worry about whether you multiply on the right or the left by lambda and, and so on. But uh, if you exercise sufficient care, that is all manageable. Uh, G of V is defined as the set of uh, G in, uh, in this uh, endomorphism algebra, but you only take the even part such that uh, G is invertible. And this is an actual matrix algebra. So this is a, this is a set of matrices uh, with entries um, in lambda, which satisfy certain conditions. So if the um, unextended version of V has an even non-degenerate form, as we have discussed previously, and, uh, it extends uniquely um, to a form on V, that means on V lambda, um, uh, in the most obvious way. And um, the orthosymplectic supergroup um, is defined as the set of those elements of GLV, um, which preserve that form, that extended form. Now notice that the elements of OSP and GL are all even by definition. So we now work in a category of lambda modules with a G action. Um, and the proof of the uh, first and second fundamental theorems proceeds um, uh, morally, in any case, in a similar way to uh, the, uh, the proof using uh, appropriate geometric techniques. Um, as in the classical cases. So the main differences are, um, you need a lot of care with signs. Um, it's easy to get those wrong. The first and second fundamental theorems for GLV um, uh, are inputs for the proof um, about uh, OSP of V. Um, the uh, theory for GLV was developed mainly by Berele and Regev, with contributions by Dillin and Morgan and Sergeyev himself. And that's where that ideal comes in. Uh, you remember that ideal with the, with the rectangular IS. I, I just mentioned that there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and yes, one needs to have a version of the standard results in algebraic geometry um, 
uh, for affine varieties over lambda. And um, uh, one proves a, a geometric main lemma in this context. Um, we now move on from uh, the uh, super world to the quantum world. And we let K be the field of rational functions in an indeterminate Q. And um, we take G to be a finite dimensional reductive complex Lie algebra, for example, GLM. The associated quantum group, and I'm not going to give a lot of detail about this, obviously don't have time. Um, <clears throat> uh, it has generators EI, FI, and KI to the plus or minus one, where L I runs from one up to L and L is the rank of G. And um, it is a uh, Hopf algebra over K, which is a non-co-commutative deformation of the universal enveloping algebra of G. G is the category of finite dimensional G modules. We have a somehow an enhanced shadow of C uh, in CQ, which is the a category of finite dimensional UQ modules of type 111, which means um, the modules we consider are sums of weight spaces where the definition of a weight vector is that um, uh, W, uh, that V has, has weight lambda if this equation holds for all I. In other words, if the diagonal generators um, act in accord with the um, uh, 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 inner product of the simple, the corresponding simple root um, with the relevant weight. So these um, uh, modules, which are sums of weight spaces, correspond. Um, the former category, which um, is isomorphic to the category of finite dimensional uh, G modules. Now, one of the keys to understanding that category is um, the tool of universal R matrices. Um, the universal R matrix is an element morally of um, the um, uh, tensor square of U2, but unfortunately um, it doesn't exactly live there because one has to take an infinite sum of elements of this tensor square, and so it's, it lives in some sort of a completion. Um, you only actually use a finite number of some ands, um, and uh, 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 but uh, technically it does li live um, in, in a complete, and it has the following properties. So it conjugates the um, co-product into the opposite co-product, where um, if uh, delta u is sigma alpha i tensor beta i, delta prime u is equal to sigma beta i tensor alpha i. Most importantly, um, the R matrices give us a solution to the yang baxter equation, where these subscripts mean, for example, R12 is R tensor the identity. Um, and R13 is uh, alpha i tensor one tensor beta i and r two three is identity tensor tensor r. So you have this equation. So the two outside components are swapped, and as a consequence of those two facts, if you compose the R matrix with a permutation where this is just a straight permutation now, no sign, um, <clears throat> and call the result R check, then R check is actually an isomorphism between um, 
the tensor product V tensor W and W tensor V. And secondly, um, if Ri is R check acting on the I, so it's R check uh, tensor identity and so on, where this is in the I, I plus one components, then <clears throat> uh, these Ri famously satisfy the braid relations. And of course, if Ri and Rj are far removed from each other, then they commute because they act on a totally different factors of the tensor um, of the tensor product. And as a consequence of this, we have a homomorphism from the group ring of the braid group on R strings to the endomorphisms of the uh, of a tensor power uh, of any tensor power of a module for uh, the quantum group. And um, <clears throat> uh, that fact is a key to understanding um, many uh, of the facts about uh, quantum group representations. So the generator sigma i of the Bray group is of course just mapped to Ri. Okay, so now to make use of this, let's take P to be the lattice of weight of our Lie algebra with respect to a Cartan subalgebra H. And let P plus be the dominant weights. The simple modules in both C and CQ, which we know are isomorphic, are indexed by dominant weights. We know that through the theory of highest weights. And for lambda, a dominant root, we write L lambda or L lambda Q for the corresponding simple module in uh, the category of finite dimensional representations of G or the type one uh, representations of UQ. So in certain cases, we can understand the action of the R matrix on V tends to be generically. So um, <clears throat> what do we mean by that? Um, the Casimir element is a central element of the um, uh, universal enveloping algebra, xj, x lower j, and x upper j are dual bases with respect to the canonical uh, killing form uh, <clears throat> uh, on, uh, on the um, uh, Lie algebra and its uh, universal enveloping algebra. Uh, this element being central, Schur's lemma operates on L lambda as a scalar. And we that scalar is very well known. It's a classical a thing, which I think was probably known already to surface Lee. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's given by this inner product. Um, there is an inner product on P, um, in fact, on all the um, uh, on the on the uh, root lattice, and rho is the half sum of the positive roots, and this is a W invariant form on H star, um, and it's normalized so that its value is two for short roots. So this applies um, even when the roots have different lengths. But the cases where this can be applied most effectively is where you start with a, a simple module corresponding to lambda. When you take its tensor square, the result is multiplicity free. You get mu i distinct um, weights um, here. And then it's known that because R check gives you a, um, <clears throat> uh, an endomorphism of this, of this module, it has to act as scalars on these. And those scalars can be shown to be 
equal to this quantity here, something which uh, Zhang and I proved many years ago. There are many special cases which people will recognize. Um, so epsilon i is the sign which occurs in the classical case. Um, <clears throat> and this, these chi lambdas are just the, the same as these ones here. To take some examples. Let's start with GLN. Um, we take the standard weights and the standard module corresponds to the first uh, fundamental weight. Um, <clears throat> and then when you take its tensor square, you get, and it's a simple calculation to work out that R check acts on the two uh, components um, uh, here as um, a, a, a Q and minus Q inverse. So it's, so this map, you remember we had a, a map from the um, grouping of the braid group uh, to end of the tensor space. We've seen here that R check has just two eigenvalues, namely Q and minus Q inverse. And so, um, we can take the quotient of the um, grouping of the braid group by this quadratic relation, and we get nothing other than the Hecker algebra A. And that is how the Hecker algebra arises um, in the study of endomorphisms of quantum modules. And the first fundamental theorem says that this map uh, nu R um, through from the Hecker algebra to the endomorphisms is surjective. And one way of proving this is to just reuse to the classical case by using integral forms of UQ and VQ and localizing. And, um, yes, I won't go into the details now um, because I'm struggling to cover the, um, uh, the material that I need to get through. I'll circulate these notes. So there'll be enough information there for um, the interested reader to fill in the details. Um, <clears throat> now, the next observation I want to make is that it's well known that the Hecker algebra has a basis which is parameterized by the symmetric group. Um, uh, we have these special elements here, um, which are defined by this equation. So it's a Q analog of the alternating element of the group ring of the symmetric group. And in fact, it yields a, um, a representation, a one-dimensional representation of the Hecke algebra, which sends each generator to minus Q inverse. The following uh, version of the, of the second fundamental theorem is um, uh, known. It's an exact analog of the uh, second fundamental theorem um, <clears throat> in the classical case. Um, you'll remember in that case, it was just the alternating idempotent in the group ring of the uh, symmetric group of degree one greater than the dimension of um, uh, V. Uh, here, it's exactly the same thing, but in the Hecke algebra. And this is also proved by some sort of a degeneration argument which uses dimensions. Let's take an important example. Um, in uh, case n equals two, you get this um, eq minus of three. Now, it's very well known that the um, it's very well known that the uh, quotient of the Hecker algebra by this idempotent is nothing but the temporally lieb algebra. Now, I haven't got time to go into it, but I'm sure there are many people here who know what the temporally lieb algebra is, has a beautiful description in terms of uh, uh, diagrams. Um, there, it's got elements that are looking like this. Um, this is in the temporally lieb category rather than the temporally lieb algebra. Um, could even have that. Um, 
what this shows is that the endomorphisms of the tensor powers of VQ are exactly equal to the um, temporally leave algebras. In fact, this can be stated as an equivalence of categories that um, the subcategory of representations of quantum SL2 or GL2, which um, it generated the full subcategory generated by powers of the two dimensional representation of quantum uh, SL2, um, is equivalent to the Tempeli Lieb category. Equivalences of categories of modules with categories of diagrams is a theme which I think is very important and deserves more study. The quantum groups of type B, C, and D, the orthogonal and symplectic cases, um, can be um, treated in a similar way, except that there are uh, more um, uh, some ands in the tensor square. So, uh, for example, uh, I think this is the orthogonal case um, relation. So you have three um, uh, some ands, and um, uh, in the symplectic one, you ha also have three some ands. Um, <clears throat> And um, it's easy to compute what the um, eigenvalues of the R matrices um, are for these uh, for these three summands. Um, I don't know whether I've written them down here, but I probably should have. Yes, here we are. Um, so you can discuss the two cases together. The eigenvalues, there are three of them, um, are Q minus Q inverse and epsilon times Q to the epsilon minus M, where epsilon is plus one in the orthogonal case and minus one in the symplectic case. And so the action of the, of the um, uh, group ring of the uh, braid group Factors through this algebra, actually a very interesting algebra. It, it is the uh, group ring of the braid group, modulo a um, cubic relation for the, for the um, generators. Now in general, the most general cubic relation um, is not sufficient to cut this algebra down to finite dimensions. So you need some extra relations. Um, yes, this is what I said here. So you can prove further relations among these um, endomorphisms. Um, <clears throat> and what you end up with is, is an algebra which has come to be known as the BMW algebra, the Berman uh, Murakami Wenzel algebra um, uh, with two parameters where of course the parameters have to be appropriately specialized for our context here. Um, and you have the following relations. I won't um, dwell on these relations too much, except to say that these generate something like the braid group, but then you have extra relations, the uh, kaufmann skein relations, and you have some de-looping relations and then from all of these, you can deduce that the GE, which are represented by uh, the uh, uh, R matrices, satisfy a cubic relation. We just specialize the parameters to our case. And uh, the result is that the, uh, there is a homomorphism from this BMW algebra to endomorphisms of tensor space um, and um, uh, there are other properties of this. And the first fundamental theorem is that this is surjective. Now, once again, this is proved um, by a localization argument. Um, it's not very difficult and um, one gets a, a something which is completely analogous to the 
um, uh, case of uh, uh, to the classical case. Now, uh, where things become a little different is in the second fundamental theorem. In the second fundamental theorem, um, uh, one needs to use, at least it's, it's, uh, it's efficient to use, um, the concept of a cellular algebra. Because it turns out that these BMW algebras um, uh, are, uh, have a lot in common with the Brouwer algebra. So a cellular algebra can be defined in many different ways, can be defined in terms of global dimension, um, but a, a good down-to-earth way is uh, to say that it has a certain uh, basis, certain type of basis, uh, which is based on a partially ordered set. And for each element of that set, um, another set M of lambda, and that the um, basis is parameterized by um, element C lambda ST, where lambda is in the partially ordered set, and S and T are elements in M of lambda. And there is a stipulation about multiplication in, in here, so which th this, this says more or less that this is a little bit like a matrix algebra um, up to error terms. So these lower terms here, lower means that uh, some of C lambda prime uh, things where lambda prime is less than uh, lambda. And then finally, um, we stipulate the existence of an anti-involution star which reverses T and X. And this, uh, all this data is called the cell datum of the algebra A and the R a, these coefficients, um, are the structure constants. They're, they're the ones which occur in the definition. Now, the point about cellular algebras is that once you know the, um, the cell datum, you can uh, describe its representation theory uh, completely explicitly. Of course, there are still problems, but in, in some sense, those problems are problems in linear algebra. So this is a description of their cell modules for each element of lambda. And it's a theorem that um, these cell modules have canonical symmetric bilinear forms, uh, which are defined in terms of the structure, that um, they're invariant, these forms are invariant, and that um, uh, a is semi-simple if and only if the radical of each one of those uh, forms uh, is uh, uh, zero. And in general, the quotient of a cell module by the radical of the form is simple or zero, and the non-zero ones form a complete set of simples. So to apply this to the uh, quantum second fundamental theorem, um, we work in this localization of the um, ring of polynomials. We make the observation that for each R, the um, algebras, the BMW algebra and the Brouwer algebra have a cellular structure with the same cell datum. So they have the same skeleton. Somehow the meat is a little different, but the skeleton is the same. So the structure constants of the, um, uh, uh, in the Brouwer algebra are obtained from those in the BMW algebra by putting Q equal to one. And for each lambda, if we uh, denote the um, corresponding cell module of the BMW algebra by WQ of lambda, and that of the Brouwer algebra by W of lambda, then W of lambda is the limit as Q goes to one of WQ of lambda, and uh, where limit is, is uh, appropriately defined. In particular, the gram matrix of the canonical form on W lambda is obtained from that on WQ of lambda by setting Q equals one as is the matrix um, of the limit um, 
of some element of Br of epsilon A. Now, suppose that we have an idempotent in the Brouwer algebra, such that the ideal is equal to the kernel of this uh, of the map from the Brouwer algebra into endomorphisms of tensor space. And we suppose that um, we have a, a, a corresponding uh, idempotent or quasi idempotent um, in the BMW algebra, which satisfies these conditions. Then it's actually a theorem that phi q generates the kernel in the, uh, in the quantum case. And so we can deduce from what we proved in the uh, classical cases that there exists such an idempotent in the orthogonal and symplectic cases in the quantum world. Symplectic case is a canonical choice. In the orthogonal case, an explicit known is known only for the case m equals three, and it's pretty complicated. I'll show it to you. This is going to be an element in BMW four of Q. So I don't think we've got time to digest it properly, but this is the formula. That's what phi Q is. And these are just the coefficients A, B, C, and D. Certain structure to this formula. Um, I will circulate the, uh, the um, and it, it exists in paper, in, in papers of mine with uh, Ruben. Um, so uh, this is not hard to find. Um, no other explicit formula is known in the quantum case for generators of the, of the kernel. The results I've outlined are generic, but they hold in a lot more generality than I've stated them. So, for example, in the classical cases, um, the results are true in all characteristics other than two. We have integrality results in the, um, in the uh, quantum case. So they're true of a Z rather than uh, C. Um, <clears throat> tilting modules for um, the classical Lie algebras at roots of unity um, in the quantum case can be analyzed uh, using uh, the above results. Um, as an example, uh, you can see the diagrammatic methods in this paper, which uh, Ruben and I wrote with uh, Anderson in the Pacific Journal a few years ago. And, um, uh, but there are still many, many unsolved problems. Uh, I'm just going to uh, finish by listing a couple of them. So firstly, the biggest problem is to find uh, composition factors of tilting modules in general, in all characteristics and all values of Q, including all roots of unity. Um, so far, only very, very uh, few general results are known. I mean, this brings us to the world of uh, Lustig's uh, character formula and so on. Secondly, there are actually very few equivalences between categories of representations and categories of diagrams. Um, the main examples which I know are the temporally lead category, which I just mentioned, uh, and UQSL2, um, SLN and the enhanced Brouwer category, which um, Ruben and I discovered in 2020, and certain Verma modules for UQSL2 and a Tangle category, which we described with Eohara. Um, but actually, these equivalences are very thin on the ground. The reason why they're desirable is because multiplicities and composition factors can uh, uh, finding finding them can be uh, reduced to purely mechanical combinatorial processes and then uh, 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 fusion categories and sure vile brower duality um, uh, there's a lot if you look through uh, the literature in particular something uh, Iohara uh, has written with us recently, uh, 
Um, there is a lot to be discovered there. And finally, I think something very exciting, um, which has recently happened, is that um, uh, the concept of a, qu a quantum symmetric pair, that means in, in the classical case, this is uh, G containing a fixed point subalgebra where theta is in involution. Um, now, when you start with a quantum group, uh, the fixed point under an involution um, isn't actually a sub quantum group of the original thing. Um, but Bao and Wang have come up with a, a completely new way of looking at this, where um, you have quantum symmetric pairs and they have a, a new type of sure vile a duality for them. And I think this could eventually uh, lead to something uh, very interesting. And I think apart from that, um, uh, I have a list of references, which I will circulate. And uh, in the meantime, I thank you for your attention. And by the way, for those who are curious about the background to my, um, uh, to where I'm sitting, uh, that is actually an image of a uh, beautiful beach on the south coast of New South Wales uh, called um, uh, Werry Beach. Uh, it, it is actually well known to Canadians. Um, uh, I've, I've met many there who come there to surf, um, although it looks rather calm uh, on, on this uh, on this. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a good morning, afternoon, I guess good lunchtime.